For someone to truly be a brand evangelist, it has to be an authentic love or affinity for the brand. I don't think it's something that can be fake. I don't think it's something that can be uh, can be put on a teleprompter or put in a script. It really has to come from the heart. Episode 46, Brand Evangelism. This is a passion of James Walker. He's Nathan's famous senior vice president of restaurants. He's a top restaurant industry expert. He's got a specialty in rebranding and repositioning iconic American comfort food brands. Companies such as Baja Fresh, Cinnabon, Johnny Rockets, and Subway. When he was at Subway as a vice president, he oversaw 28,000 restaurants in the U.S. and Canada. He's conducted business in more than 70 international markets. If there's anyone who understands brand evangelists, Creating a restaurant experience that creates that wow, that Instagrammable moment. It's my next guest, James Walker. Well, James, welcome to the program. Thank you. Happy uh, that you were able to include me. Yeah, well, we've, we've been talking a little bit offline about just how important it is for um, a company to have brand uh, evangelists. I know this is a, a, a passion of yours, but before we really jump into that topic, for people who may not know James Walker, give people a little bit of a, of a background of, of your backstory, how you ended up in the restaurant business and uh, the position you are now in. Uh, that's a, that's a, actually an interesting question. And I'm, I'm not sure I've actually ever been asked that before, uh, which, which means, uh, I've got to think about it for a moment. Um, <laughs> well, you know, I know. So live fire right off the bat. James. Sure. Sure. Uh, and that's, that's awesome. Uh, I think my, my move into the restaurant business, um, goes back to the, the early nineties. And, and I know I'm dating myself, uh, here, and really, my career trajectory uh, was fueled through my love of food. Just you know, the just loving food and loving service as well. And I think both of those things are really important. Um, you know, absolutely saw that there was a place for me to be able to build a career around my passion for great service and great food and initially went the culinary route. So, uh, you know, I, I cooked for a living in a, a number of fine dining restaurants and kind of worked my way through, you know, through that process. And ultimately with a young family felt it was, um, safer from a career trajectory standpoint to move over to to management uh which i did in the the late 90s and early 2000s and really you were a chef you cooked i did yeah and i i still still love uh love to cook at home love to cook in the restaurants and you know i try i'm a a very positive person um you know i i love life uh i you know, there's so many great things this world has to offer us, and I try to focus on the positives. So when I look at the stay-at-home order in the pandemic, it allowed me to to cook in a way that I haven't cooked um, since I cooked professionally. So to make things that, you know, took three days or required a lot of preparation. So, yeah, to answer your question, yes, uh, I was a <laughs> chef for uh, a number of years. Well known fact about James Walker. There, there you go. Uh, yeah, it's, it's an, an educational program. Well, uh, <laughs> but, you know, when you confuse your passion with your work, it's no longer work. And that's what enables people to be successful. And that's an ongoing theme here on Winning at Work is, you know, how are people ascending to the highest levels in their professions? And it's really clear if you're doing something just for the love of money, it's very difficult to reach the top. And certainly when it comes to restaurants and branding and rebranding, um, you know, you're definitely at the top of the food chain, no pun intended. Um or maybe pun intended. That's actually a pretty good one. Sure. Well, and I have I have to make a comment on what you just said. Uh, myself being in the restaurant business, I absolutely would say that it's it's an industry where if you're going to be successful, you need to be passionate and you need to be into the details. 
having said that, when I step outside uh, of the restaurant business, I hope that you know what? I hope that there's people and maybe they're artists or musicians that just have such amazing innate talent uh, that they can be worldwide successes without having to uh, to put in the long hours and, and hard hard work. At least, you know, I, I like having that dream that there are people out there that are just so great at what they do or have such a, a God-given talent that they can be successful. I know for myself uh, and for the, the restaurant business and those I surround myself with, when I look at individuals who've been successful in this industry, uh, it's, it's through hard work and passion. Yeah, no doubt. There are a very few, select few people who are just so talented that their talent rises to the top. We might see that in sports, but that's a topic for another time. When you and I first met, it became very clear that, yes, you are very much an optimist, but really your passion was shining through when we spoke more about this idea of brand evangelism. And this is a topic that I think everyone wants to learn, you know, really learn from you. Tell us a little bit more about that experience um, within Nathan's Famous and, and just what your approach is to creating and engaging and catering to these brand evangelists. You know, I think when when I start thinking about brand evangelism and brand evangelists and what, you know, what is underneath that? And I, I think you and I traded some emails as to, you know, whether evangelists, you know, do you find them? Do you make them? And I thought about that and I came up with one word that I think, um, you know, really is at the heart of brand evangelism. And that's authentic or authenticity. For someone to truly be a brand evangelist, it has to be an authentic love or affinity for the brand. I don't think it's something that can be faked. I don't think it's something that can be uh, can be put on a teleprompter or put in a script. It really has to come from the heart. And to speak of myself as an internal brand evangelist, and I think uh, evangelists can be internal and external, and I'll use myself as an example of both, Internally, as the Senior Vice President of Restaurants for Nathan's Famous, I am an authentic internal brand evangelist. And what I mean by that is I have a love and affinity for the brand. And that is more than just I like to use the brand's offerings. In this case, I'd love to eat our New York cheesesteak and our, our hot dogs and uh, enjoy the food offerings. But I think brand evangelism also means that you have an understanding of the brand and what that brand really stands for. So myself, as an example of an internal, I'm, I'm an employee, I'm a leader within the organization. And I think you can hear in my voice, you can see in videos or podcasts, how passionate I am about the brand uh, and, and the respect I have for its history and the brand architecture. To move over to the other side, I think brand evangelists can be external. And in some cases, external brand evangelists, um, not only are they authentic, but they have that strength uh, of conviction that they're not being paid. They're not benefiting from the uh, the evangelism that they're conveying. So uh, I'll talk about uh, a couple of brands that I just absolutely love. And why don't we do it in the restaurant space if that's okay? Yeah, that makes perfect sense. So, you know, uh, if you follow me on Twitter or follow me on LinkedIn, I absolutely am a brand evangelist for Chick-fil-A and In-N-Out Burger. These are brands that I just absolutely love. Um, I love their offerings. I love how they treat their people, um, both internally and externally. I think both of those brands are similar in the fact that their employees are treated very, very well, and they treat their consumers, their guest base with that same loving care. So myself as a brand evangelist for these two brands, I received nothing for that, you know, for that evangelism. But absolutely, if anyone's going to ask me, uh, you know, where should I go for a great dining experience at a at a very reasonable price point. Those are two brands, depending on whether I'm talking to somebody in Atlanta, Georgia, or Orange County, California, I might direct them to one one or the other. 
but I love that brands can have evangelists that truly aren't benefiting uh, in a material fashion or a monetary fashion. They just love the brand and love talking about it. And I think there's a lot of power in that as well. Tell us a little bit about just in your experience, how your employees actually help promote your brand, you know, at the store level. So when I think of employees and, and because we're talking about the restaurant space, um, to me, the most important employees from a guest interaction standpoint are probably those cashiers, the individuals who are actually face to face with the guest, whether it's through a drive through window or, or over a register, you know, that's really where uh, I think that brand evangelism is going to happen. And, and just to, to use maybe, um, I don't know if folks have dictionaries, right? But the old Webster dictionary, when I think of, of, the definition of evangelism, it's someone who is trying to convince someone of something with great conviction and enthusiasm. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that evangelism is positive. So, you know, I have visited restaurant companies where that hourly employee certainly enthusiastically and with great conviction convinced me that that brand was not a good brand and that their job wasn't a good job. They weren't being treated well. And myself as a customer, I said, wow, you know, what's being conveyed to me or evangelized, you know, from this, uh, this brand ambassador, if you will, is really negative. You know, that's a bad experience. So you've probably heard that we all, as restaurant leaders, we lead by example, whether it's a good example or bad example. People are looking at us and saying, that's how I should behave. I think when you think of, you know, those hourly employees, they are evangelizing your brand. It's not necessarily positive. So let's talk about the positive side. You know, how do we, that's really the important piece is to make sure that they are evangelizing, speaking with enthusiasm and conviction to other potential employees, to other existing employees, and absolutely to your customer base. And I don't think it's something that can happen by accident. Um, I go back to those best-in-class brands, you know, Chick-fil-A and In-N-Out Burger. I think they spend a lot of time thinking about how they treat their people and how they create a great working environment um, and that leads to this positive conveyance of the experience from the hourly employee to the actual guest. So I don't think it's something that just happens by, by happenstance. I think you really have to look at the quality of life you're providing for these employees. Um, for example, at Nathan's, we're undergoing this brand transformation, um, and we're looking at new uniforms and, you know, what should those uniforms look like and how would they match our new design and decor and what what is it saying about us as a brand? But probably the most important part of that exercise was to actually give uniforms to employees and, and ask them, do you like the way it feels? Do you like the way it looks? Does it make you proud to wear it? You know, are, are you going to feel that this makes a statement about you that you're aligned with? So I think involving employees as brands move forward as they grow, as they change, which they always do. And certainly looking consciously at what you can do to create a great environment for your your team. Yeah, that's really smart. Rather than just approaching it from a, this matches our color scheme and it's cost effective. Here, you guys wear this and now they're they're miserable wearing it and they've got a rash. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, what a horrible experience, not just for them, but everyone that has to come in and interact with them. So this to me really touches on something that you and I had talked about before, but that was, I think you said it was, you were fanatical down to the nuances. I don't think that's exactly how you said it, but to me, I think that's a great example of that. Uh, and that's, you know, I'm not sure if I said that, but it does sound like something I would say. So it, it, uh, I'm, you I'm are getting own credit it. for that. You're getting credit for that. Yeah. So, you know, when I look at, um, you know, moving a brand forward, um, one of the things we didn't talk about, but I, I think it's important for me to throw out there as a baseline. When I've come into a brand, um, I think leaders and ownership groups and management teams, when they take over leadership of a new brand, may 
may make the mistake. It's saying, what don't they do well? Where are their opportunities? Where is their red in the P&L? And let's focus on what we don't do well. And let's, you know, let's try to get that up to a level that's acceptable. And I certainly can't argue with that logic, but what has worked better for me and certainly has been my focus, um, you know, coming into Nathan's is let's find a way that the brand can grow faster, increase the cadence, increase the speed of expansion, but do so by doing what the brand truly, truly does well. So when you look at a brand like Nathan's Famous, what's in their DNA is a couple of things. One, the innate New Yorkness of the brand. We say that we are the flavor of New York. You don't get much more New York from a food standpoint than a brand that started in Coney Island in 1916. So, you know, staying focused and using that as our North Star. Nathan from, Handworker. That's right. Absolutely. Nathan Handworker back in and selling hot dogs for a nickel, uh, which we still do in a lot of occasions on Thursdays, by the way. Uh, but understanding what the brand is known for uh, and what the brand does well. So when I looked at Nathan's and I looked through the eyes of a general manager and a grill cook, so I spent um, the first few weeks in a restaurant, you know, cooking hot dogs, cooking burgers, making French fries, trying to understand uh, the life of an hourly employee and life of a manager. What I found was we are very focused on having great food, great food that in some cases really transcends uh, QSR or fast food. So when I looked at what we could do to increase the pace of growth within the organization, that was, those were really the benchmarks that we are the flavor of New York. So making sure that the guardrails, if you will, uh, of, of the innate in Nork, uh, New Yorkness of the brand was still in place, but also very focused on quality. So when you talk about being into the subtle details or the nuances of the brand, really what myself and the, the team did is we walked through the restaurant and we touched and experienced everything that either an employee or a guest would touch or interact with. And, you know, down to subtle nuances. So, you know, we launched a new uh, half fried chicken, uh, a pound and a half fried chicken, you know, this beautiful um, chicken product with great sauces. And when we sat down and we looked at it and, you know, it was beautiful and we say all of our food has to be memorable, craveable and Instagrammable, it was all those things. But when I grabbed a fork to eat it, I said, you know what? This is not the plastic fork that belongs with this chicken. If we're going to carry this chicken, we need to get a better quality plastic fork. And then we need to get a better quality plastic knife. And then we need higher quality salt. And, you know, really experiencing everything that a guest would touch and making sure that it aligns with the brand and the brand architecture. And then I'd reiterate, you have to do the same thing uh, from an employee standpoint. If employees don't have the absolute right tools for their job and they don't feel that they're supported, you're not going to have that, you know, that conveyance of brand evangelism from your hourly team that you're going to want to have. That's interesting. So you yourself, as a lover of the product, the brand, everything that it stands for, you actually went through and became a, you know, kind of a, a product user and looked at the customer experience and you used yourself as the litmus test. Absolutely. And I, I think, you know, one of the things that's great being having been a, in the restaurant business for more years than uh, I think I've already dated myself, but we're not dating lot, ourselves. We're not dating ourselves. <laughs> a lot of years is when I'm when I'm new to a brand and I'm only, let's say, a month or a month and a half in and I'm beginning to learn the brand architecture from the inside, but I'm still able to look at the brand as a passionate consumer. I think restaurant executives, there's a lot of power in that. The fact that you understand how things look from behind the counter looking out. But you absolutely understand still what it's like to be a consumer of that brand. And it's an opportunity to bring both sides of the counter, if you will, together to create just a fantastic guest experience. Do you find that there's much collaboration between executives from other companies? Or do you find that 
it's more of a siloed approach to to this business of uh, what you call it QSR or, or just fast food. Uh, you know, I think it depends on, you know, the, the brands that we're talking about. Um, you know, I don't know in the larger brands that there are a lot of collaboration um, because they have just fantastic resources. When you look at a brand like a McDonald's, they just have phenomenal resources and intelligence and analytics um, to really drive the brand in the direction that they need to go from a future standpoint. I think smaller brands, um, I know just speaking for myself, I spend a lot of time looking at what other brands are doing. And while I certainly would not be ashamed to talk about who I might copy uh, or just take their idea as is, that doesn't happen very much. What happens more so is looking at something that a brand I admire, like the ones I mentioned, uh, like Shake Shack, like Zaxby's, you know, these are brands that, that do great things. And I may look at something they they do and translate. Okay, how could we how could we take what they're doing and make it our own, make it unique to us, um, and do so in a way that that enhances the brand? I'll, I'll give you one example of that. the The example I'll give is uh, Impossible Foods and just the phenomenal success that the Burger King team had with the Impossible Whopper. They they really, in my opinion, did an awful lot to drive the plant-based protein um, into kind of the, the daily life of many, many Americans, Americans who were not vegetarians or vegans necessarily. They were just looking to do something either better um, – you know, for themselves from a health standpoint or better for, for the earth. Um, and we looked at that and we said, you know, that's, we like that. We like what those guys did. And that sat in the back of my mind for, uh, honestly, for more than a year and a half at Nathan's until we said, okay, we've figured out how, how to take that impossible product that we love, but do it in a way that doesn't look even remotely like what the, the Burger King guys did and had such great success with, it's something that is unique to us. So I go back to, you know, our benchmark is every piece of food, everything we serve, including condiments, has to be memorable, craveable, and Instagrammable. So we came up with the Nathan's version of an Impossible Burger with a full half pound of Impossible uh burger cooked to order cook fresh um you know a beautiful everything bagel seated new york roll from baltazar bakery so we created something that was very unique something that was very nathan something that was very new york but really it was uh the genesis of that and i'll give them credit was looking at this great success that the burger king team had and not saying okay i want to do that as well but using that more as uh, as something that got me thinking and ultimately you know more than a year later we found a way to translate that into our own brand that's a great example. You were simply inspired by that. And if we do look at the plant-based food uh, rise in popularity, it's certainly um, a great idea because a lot of a lot of brands are incorporating that into their uh, product offering. You touched on this at, at the beginning. We kind of debated, you know, our, our uh, evangelist or, or is evangelism, is it made, is it created? And you said it, it really has to do with, you know, it starts with being authentic. Um, but what if you're a brand starting out and you, you don't have this fabulous 100-year history and this unique a recipe that's been passed down? Would, would you have any advice for you're just starting? This is how you would go about it. Well, so whether it was is, is created um, over a period of time or whether it's just innately there, I think a lot of brands start with a founder – who, you know, he is the original evangelist. He is the architect of that brand. And you've probably spent a lot of time with restaurant brand um, innovators and originators and founders. You know, where I've been able to spend time with individuals who've started brands, they understand the brand at, at a level 
that really is unparalleled, even within their organization. So their employee 001, and maybe there's a lot more zeros there, but they're the first employee, even those employees who join near the beginning of brands that have been around 20, 30 or more years, they just don't have that understanding of, of the heart and soul of the brand that, uh, that a founder may have. So I have a lot of respect for those individuals who, uh, who go out and create something. So I do think, you know, that creation comes from the founder um, and then is translated and built over time through experience that resonates with consumers and, and with other employees. So my brand, uh, the love for Nathan's famous uh, really happened many, many years before I ever was lucky enough to go to work for them. It used to be, you know, if I went to New York, I had to go to Nathan's. That's what you did, right? You you have to do that. Exactly. Um, so I didn't create those uh, those items that that resonated with myself as a consumer. They really to your point, go back to, to Nathan Handworker and creating this very special and I think uniquely flavorful product. Uh, and then, you know, Nathan and the team that followed him building onto the brand and creating more and more elements that just resonated with me as a consumer. So I think, um, you know, that that position of evangelist can both be created typically by a founder or a team of founders or a family. And it also certainly can be built uh, over time through experience. I think you really nailed it with the founder, the first employee. It starts with them. I don't know why that didn't dawn on me the way you, but you laid it out so so perfectly because I know people are thinking, well, how can I create it? Well, it, it really does start at the top, doesn't it, with that uh, – with that leadership team. It does. And, you know, when I think of, you know, the, the leaders and founders and kind of, you know, the, the people who've started brands, they just understand, um, you know, some of the nuance in the brand that others just can't understand. Now that you can convey to them what it is, maybe, I don't know that that's a hundred percent, but you can try to convey and educate people. But I, I don't know that you you ever get that that same level of understanding. This might be a good time to segue into our conversation about talent because none of this operation is going to be successful if you don't have the talent on the ground or there at the corporate office, and so. You and I were talking. You know, we were just kind of joking about the the sure. pace well, of I, I change think the, you know, in the this industry is just certainly incredible. in the restaurant business has been challenging um, so prior to COVID. Now you're faced um, with hiring, you know, right? You've got to build out talent, this, this team of um, fantastic the, people. So I believe at that point how are you time, going to hire? How, how do you hire people that thrive in this type of an environment? And maybe and tell people a little bit more about the you know, environment the if they're not familiar. And then you go into COVID, and things got much more difficult. Uh, for all the reasons that I think folks know. And I'm not sure that the restaurant business was hurt uh, more than any other business, but it certainly was impacted um, in a very material fashion. And just myself talking to other brand leaders or individuals on, on boards of, of other restaurant organizations or private equity groups, what they found was within their executive team, there were three large buckets. Uh, those individuals who just didn't have the desire or wherewithal to uh, to really find ways to add value during the pandemic and all the challenges that, that came about because of it. So folks that said, you know what, I'm going to sit on the sideline and when this passes, whenever that is, and, and things return to normal, you know, I'll, I'll be back uh, at 9 a.m. that Monday morning. So, you know, that was one bucket. Uh, the other bucket was individuals who wanted to help, who wanted to uh, find ways to help pivot the business during, you know, this just massive headwind of challenges and opportunities that the pandemic caused. They had the desire to do so, but they didn't have the skill set. Um, so they might know the the need um, 
to change, the need to pivot the business. They just didn't have the skill set to do to do so. And then that last bucket were individuals who said, I know that we need to change. I have the desire to do so and either had the skill set to help pivot the business or the positions or the team, or they went out and got that capability. So I think your question is, how do we find more of that? Those, those employees, those team members that would fit in the, the last bucket. Is that a, a fair statement? You know, you and I talked very briefly a, a couple of weeks ago about this. And I remember saying, I, I don't think that this skill set, this ability to, uh, to move in uh, and out of a job description, this ability to pivot. What I think you, you really do nailed it. This willing and capable the day basis to add value to an organization. I'm not sure that that's something that can be tested for, uh, or or comes through very clearly in black and white on a resume. I think really it's open dialogue during the interview process where you're looking for indications of stress triggers, um, indications of what really drive people. And I think what you're looking for are individuals who, you know, get a smile on their face and sit forward in their chair during the interview in a face-to-face -face interview or even on a Zoom or, or a video interview when they start talking about how they've risen to challenges in the business um, or changes within the organization and that they see those types of, of uh, points in history as good things and inflection points where they're able to drive their career, uh, add value to an organization, and frankly, make themselves more valuable within the company. And I think what you're trying to avoid are are those individuals who are are very focused on i want to know every element of my job um you know uh, do you do you have a job description and can we go through it and i understand at different levels a, a job description is much more important uh for hourly employees um i think even up to general managers job descriptions are an important way to ensure that the hard skills are there i think when you get to senior leadership within an organization it's less about checking boxes on a job description and it's more about how individuals utilize their experience, their skill set, and their willingness to learn to be able to deal with opportunities and challenges within the organization that may be different during their entire tenure with that company. I hope everyone who's listening writes that down because if that is not the the perfect framework of the types of skills and traits that you're trying to hire, that I, I was literally nodding as you're talking about, you know, who can rise to the challenge and people who are so focused on the day to day, what is my job going to be? That's a person who is not a flexible, not an open minded uh, person that can easily roll with changes because the pace of change is incredible within restaurants. So you've got to be able, you've got to be great Absolutely. at thinking and on I, your feet I don't and, and think dealing it's an with easy change. Process. I don't. Think um, it's I think a, you a mentioned this process. to me before I that think it is um, really sitting there, down. There is a class, and having, not a class of people. Uh, an there's open a conversation may, maybe an, uh, with an age candidate. of people. Um, you know, they, think, they keep you know, they make the mistake of thinking they're good they're willing at to dealing with change, but in fact they're not, and that's something that you do need to identify when you're hiring. Those types of things are going to help help educate you on, on whether or not this is something they're, they're truly good at or something that they just, from a game say standpoint, are you good at change? Absolutely. I'm good at change. You know, I just verbally check that box. One of the things I, I <laughs> absolutely. And, and I think, you know, even, uh, with individuals who do a lot of hiring, uh, 
sometimes we do ask leading questions just because it moves us on. Uh, and I think this is one area that, that I think we have to be uh, much more careful and ask for examples and really look for those indications. Right. You, you, um, it's you know, meeting it's, of it's a question. Exactly. When you start talking about change within an organization, change within jobs, you know, is this, are they sitting forward and talking about it? Um, you know, are they on the edge of their chair? Are they sitting back and crossing their arms? Um, the other thing I look at is just, you know, I'm very lucky that I am part of a team that absolutely uh, is able to pivot how they add value to the organization in a very agile fashion. And I was just thinking of within my team, if we're meeting a new vendor or a potential new franchise owner, how my team uh, how they identify themselves, how they introduce themselves. So I've been in organizations where introductions are very much about two things, about tenure and about title. And I, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. You know, how long have you been here and, and what's the highest position you've attained and what does it say on your business card? But what I really love about the team that I'm part of now, and I think speaks to their ability to add value wherever it is, is they kind of stumble over their titles because their titles don't really do justice to what they do. So, you know, they don't speak up with their titles or their tenure. They briefly and almost uh, under their breath would give their title, but then they'll spend 30 seconds or, or, or a minute saying, but this is what I do, or this is what I'm doing now. And, um, you know, what makes me smile at that is it's, it's a clear indication that they know the value that they're providing to the organization isn't in that job title. It's these things that they're doing to help move the business forward. And, that may be different, how they identify what value and what they do for the organization. It may be different this month, and it might be different six months from now. But I think that's an indication of a, a team that's not looking at their title. They're really looking at how they add value. Yeah, that sounds like that's an action-oriented person rather than I've attained, I've achieved, I've reached this level, and – Really, in life, you want people who are constantly striving, who never feel like they've arrived. So maybe that's not exactly what you're saying, but that, I think that's the one of the other messages I get out of that. I, th I think that's uh, I, I would agree with that, and I think my, my comments are, are very aligned with that. If if you spend your time looking in the rearview mirror versus looking out the windshield, I think it's those individuals who who use the miles that are past them as experience to help them go forward. Um, faster with less fear uh, and embrace change, you know, that's a positive. Yes, I've had, you know, a, a 20 some odd year career, but it's not about me looking back and patting myself on the back. It's what can I do to move forward, hopefully faster, hopefully with less fear because I've had this experience that's going to allow me to face new challenges and new opportunities. Yeah, I think if you've got a a long-term goal, a vision, a, a purpose for what you're doing, and it's transcendental enough, meaning it's not so specific and not so time-based. It's a, it's a, it's an idealistic state that you never quite reach. So you're always striving for it, for it. <clears throat> and I think it kind of shows up in those types of people. It's, in fact, it's one of the first exercises that I put my my uh, new employees through as I force them to go through the this type of process rather than just thinking, you know, we have daily goals, weekly goals. No, we have goals to help people and you'll never finish helping people because there's more people than you can ever touch. So it kind of is this constant striving, constant evolving yeah, I, I I like that a lot, and I think you know when you're when you're thinking of uh, of brands and um, you know how you're you're building and conveying your culture to the team. Um, I think you know I look at you know brands' mission statements, and I know a lot of brands live by their mission statements, and you know they recite them uh, sometimes a little too dogmatically, and other brands don't pay attention to them at all. 
when I look at that, you know, perpetual movement, we're always moving forward. A lot of times I'll look at a brand's mission statement and does it have a finish line or not? Or is it about, hey, we're, we're going to continue to evolve. We're going to continue to move forward and we're going to be better tomorrow than we were today. Or is it I'm aspiring to be a brand of X and that is a, a point certain. Um, certainly, um, you know, where I've been able to work on mission statements, um, it, it really is focused on this perpetual movement. There isn't a finish line. It's focused on being better tomorrow than we were today. I've learned a lot from you today, and I know there's people out there that uh, are starting brands. There's, We've got all these trends. I know that you guys are capitalizing on the uh, ghost kitchen. I know you've talked about it before. We're not necessarily going to go into it, but... Um, with all this, you know, rapid expansion, you know, it's very important for people to be thinking about how they engage with and cater to those people that love their brand. And I think you've shed a lot of light on on how to go about doing that and building it from the ground up. And I, I really appreciate uh, you being here today and, and giving us some of your your thoughts and expert opinions on that. Uh, absolutely, my pleasure. Any any time I can start a conversation by talking about hot dogs, I'm all in. <laughs> well, and go out and buy some because the weather is, we're finally heating up. It's, uh, well, like you said, you know, people were eating before, but now, I mean, it, it, absolutely, the, the grills are becoming uncovered, uh, the perfect time for um, a Nathan's dog. By the way, b before we go, is there anything you'd, you'd like to add about the, um, about the company? This will be another year uh, of, of innovation for the brand. Um, over the past two years, uh, a lot of our innovation has been outside of that all-important hot dog and, and French fry. Um, you know, the hot dog and fry were already at the top of their game. And not only were we not going to change it, it's not where we focused. So we focused on partnerships with Pat LaFrida to develop a cheesesteak and Mark Miller to develop a, a hand battered chicken program. This year going forward, there will be innovation around the hot dogs and fries. And that doesn't mean that we're changing our recipe. Uh, no, we're not. But how we're able to deliver those ideas iconic hot dogs and fries, that's really what we're looking forward to bringing to the world uh, over the next 12 months. So stay tuned. All right. Well, we'll be staying tuned. Well, James, thank you for being here today. Absolutely. My pleasure.